morning, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of Radcliffe Talks Real Estate. I'm uh, Marie-Claire Bleasdale, and with my colleague, Matthew Mills, uh, we are members of the Radcliffe uh, Real Estate team, and we're going to be talking to you today. Um, I'm going to start talking to you about break clauses, and then I'll pass over to Matthew, who will be talking about easements, uh, what is an interference with an easement, and uh, what your remedies are if your easement is interfered with. So, uh, without any further ado now, hopefully, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the law that applies to break clauses and the, the issues that practitioners need to be aware of when advising landlords and tenants on their rights to break a lease. Um, it's an area of landlord and tenant law, like many others, where attention to detail is key and mistakes can have uh, potentially disproportionate consequences. So I'm going to start off by running through the general principles and then I'll move on to the recent decision in Capital Park Leeds and Global Radio. So I'm going to start really, really basic here. What is a break clause? Um, well, it's a clause in the lease that gives the parties to the right to end the lease early. It's similar to an option or a form of unilateral contract or if contract. And what that means is any conditions attaching to the break must be strictly performed. And this was uh, explained by Lord Diplock in the case of United Scientific Holdings um, back in 1978 as follows. Um, when you have a unilateral or an if contract, if someone has stipulated the terms on which they will enter into that contract, uh, then the court will not force them to enter into the contract on um, different terms. The authorities on um, the exercise of break notices uh, have been considered by the Court of Appeal in detail in the more recent decision of Siemens Hearing and Friends Life. Um, that was a decision in which the uh, main judgment of the court was given by Lord Justice Lewison, and in which he explained that even trivial non-compliance with a condition um, on which the exercise of a break clause depends will preclude its successful exercise. Uh, he acknowledged in that case that the decision that was reached by the Court of Appeal was a harsh uh, decision and he gave um, practitioners in this field a very clear warning when he said the clear moral is if you want to avoid expensive litigation and the possible loss of a valuable right to break, you must pay close attention to all the requirements of the clause, including the formal requirements and follow them precisely. So having passed on that warning to you, I'm going to now turn to the various different matters that we as practitioners have to pay close attention to. Um, and starting off with the question of who is entitled to exercise uh, the break clause. And you're going to have to, um, in considering your break um, provisions, carefully consider the provisions of the lease. Uh, does the clause specify that it's a lessor's only break, a lessee's only break, or can it be exercised by both? And it's important to be aware of the fact that where it's not specified, there's a 19th century decision that des decides that it's only a lessee's break clause. Um, you're going to have to consider whether success is entitled can exercise the break? And the answer to that question is they can, unless the break clause is uh, specifically expressed to be personal only to the original lessee or the original lessor. And the authority for that is Max Factor. Um, and that applies even where your uh, definition clauses in the lease for lessor or lessee do not expressly include successors in title. And the authority for that is Olympia York Canary Wharf um, case that I've noted down there. Uh, where you have joint owners, then all of the joint owners have to join in giving the notice. And that applies both uh, to joint lessees and also uh, to joint lessors. And I think a point that it is very important at the moment to have regard to is that the right to break is vested in the legal not the beneficial owner. And I've come across this recently because you're probably all aware of the delays that there are now registering title at the land registry. Um, so there can be quite a long time between when you file your application for registration and when you're actually make, your client actually makes it onto the title. 
And uh, Brown and Root Technology is authority for the fact that it is only the legal owner that is entitled to exercise the break clause. So who has to be served? Um, well, if they all have to be. And it's important to be aware that agents cannot be served with notices unless they are expressly authorised to receive the break notice. Um, Again, you have to carefully consider the provisions of the lease in looking at how your break notice is served. Um, there may be express requirements in the break clause on the mode of service, and if there are, those must be complied with. Um, if there isn't any express requir requirement, then unless the contrary intention is expressed, Section 196 of the Law of Property Act, um, I've seen an error there, it should be 1925, applies. Um, and the authority for that is Wandsworth and Atwell. And in the very unusual circumstance um, that section 196 does not apply, uh, then you're reliant on common law uh, for the method of service. And you'll be aware that that requires that the notice is actually communicated uh, to the recipient party. Um, form of a break notice? Well, there are various requirements in relation to form, um, and the most obvious is going to be in relation to timing. And break notices can be either rolling breaks, which can be exercised at any particular time, or there may be specific anniversaries or dates specified in the lease um, on which the notice, uh, the, the, the lease can be broken. It's really important to comply strictly with any of these requirements, that is both get the date correct for terminating the lease and also make sure that the correct length of notice has been provided uh, because uh, time is of the essence in uh, the exercise of break clauses. And uh, where there is in the lease a particular requirement in relation to the form of a notice, again, um, that must be strictly complied with. Um, so you need to check, uh, is there a mandatory form of break notice attached to the lease? If there is, that must be used. Or are there an express form of words that has to be used? And it was a case about an express form of words. Uh, the Siemens hearing case was about an express form of words. Uh, the lease in that case required the tenant to serve a notice expressed to be served under Section 24 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. Uh, the tenant did serve a notice that complied in all respects with section 24 of the 54 Act, but omitted the key words, as the Court of Appeal found they were, in which it said that it was given pursuant to the section 24, uh, section 24 of the Act. And um, Lord Justice New uh, Lewison said that even though that had no practical consequences or any detriment at all uh, to the landlord, the omission of uh, those words meant that the break notice was invalid and the lease continued. So it really is an example of how very important it is to make sure that you have carefully considered exactly what is required and complied with it. And um, if there aren't any specific form of words required under the lease, then what you have to do, of course, is make sure that your words are clear and un un unambiguous. And so they must clearly state that the lease is being terminated and when it's being terminated. Um, and you should be very careful not to use words that might be suggest uh, to indicate that the, le uh, the tenant is only considering the exercise of its break rights. So what about mistakes? Um, I think the first thing, of course, to remember, if you think that you've made a mistake in a notice, is uh, check whether you have time to serve another notice, because uh, you can serve further notices without prejudice to relying upon um, the notice that has already been served. And that must be the first thing to do so that you can have a notice that isn't disputed as being invalid and you don't need to have to argue about the consequences of any mistakes. But um, mistakes aren't necessarily fatal. And uh, the key case uh, dealing with that, of course, is Manai and Eagle Star. Um, where notices under contractual rights have errors, they may still be valid if they are sufficiently clear and unambiguous to leave a reasonable recipient in no reasonable doubt as to how and when they are intended to operate. So obviously that's an objective test, looking at the form of the notice 
and asking what does that notice communicate to the reason, reasonable recipient. And um, you must remember that this is a two stage test um, as explained by the Court of Appeal in Trafford Metropolitan Borough Council. Uh, Manai is only relevant at the first stage of that test. Um, what does the notice mean? Uh, once the court has decided what the notice means, it then has to turn to the requirements of the break clause and ask whether it complies with the contractual requirements of that clause. Um, mistakes aren't only made in relation to dates. Um, it's fairly common to come across mistakes in identifying the landlord and sometimes even surprisingly in identifying the lessee who's trying to exercise the break. And I've given you there um, some authorities that are uh, cases in which the court has found that despite a mistake in naming the landlord, for example, putting the name of the previous landlord into the notice, um, the notice was never, nevertheless valid because it was received by the correct um, landlord. Um, in Havant Internationals, Mr Justice Hart decided that a notice given by a subsidiary of the tenant company was nevertheless uh, valid. Uh, I think though, however, it's really important to understand that these kinds of case, cases turn um, on their facts and maybe also on the judge that you find yourself in front of um, on the day because um, Mr. Justice Newberger in uh, Lemabel um, uh, was not prepared to find that a notice which incorrectly named the lessee uh, was valid. Uh, so your break clauses will frequently contain conditions uh, which have to be complied with in order for the break to be exercised. And where conditions are set out in the break clause, they have to be strictly performed. And um, there could be two different kinds of conditions, absolute requirements and then um, qualified requirements. Dealing firstly with absolute requirements, examples of those kinds of requirements will be a requirement that all rent or other sums due under the lease are paid, um, that all tenant covenants or usually uh, tenant repairing covenants are complied with, and that the tenant must give vacant possession on the break date. Um, it's important to know and, um, uh, and good news that spent breaches are not relevant. So if a tenant has previously in been in breach of their lease, if they are no longer in breach uh, of the lease, then that will not prevent them from exercising their break rights. Um, but uh, Finch and Underwood is clear authority approved by Lord Justice New, uh, Lewison in, in Siemens that even if a breach is trifling, it will not be overlooked uh, when there's an absolute requirement uh, to comply with the covenants in the lease in order to exercise break. Um, sometimes the conditions require um, qualified compliance with the covenants and examples will be where the clause provides that there should be no material breach of the tenant's covenants or of the tenant's repairing obligations or another form of words might be no substantial breaches. And uh, the test for how you determine whether or not there is a substantial or material breach is set out in Fitzroy House um, it's an objective test and the materiality is to be assessed by reference to the ability of the landlord to relet or sell the property without delay or additional expenditure. Uh, you may even come across a lease uh, where a tenant solicitor has desperately tried to water down uh, the condition uh, to the exercise of the break and has managed to persuade the landlord to include a, um, reasonable compliance with the uh, tenant's covenants. Um, I think then you probably in the situation where uh, you have the opportunity for plenty of uh, litigation. Um, such a phrase was considered by the court in 1960 in Gardner and Blacksill. Um, it's a less onerous clause than uh, there being material compliance uh, with the tenant's covenants. Um, but what the court said in that case uh, was the tenant's covenants have to be satisfied um, by the tenant behaving during the tenancy as a reasonable tenant would with regard to their obligations under the lease. And I think we'll all be well aware of the fact that um, there's going to be plenty of scope for arguing about how a reasonable tenant uh, might behave. 
So um, that then brings me to the, uh, the Court of Appeal decision in Capital Park and Global Radio. Um, this was a case in which Global Radio um, bought a business, um, a media business up uh, in Leeds that had broadcasting studios in Leeds, but Global Radio had no use for those broadcasting studios and so wanted to exercise uh, the tenant's break. Um, the break clause, clause entitled the tenant to break the lease at the end of the 15th year on at least six months notice. Uh, on condition that all rent and other payments due at the date of the notice were paid and that the tenant gave vacant possession of the premises. Uh, but in the lease, the premises were specifically defined as including all fixtures and fittings at the premises whenever fixed, except those which are generally regarded as tenants or trades fixtures and fittings and all additions and improvements made to the premises and any outside parts and any signage erected by or on behalf of the tenant upon the estate and references to the premises include any part of it. Um, the lease contained uh, standard repairing obligations and also a tenant's obligation to yield up the premises at the end of the term uh, in accordance uh, with the tenant's repairing obligations. Uh, before the break date, the tenant had actually stripped the premises and they were effectively bare. Um, what had been taken out were ceilings, ceiling grids, fire barriers, uh, column boxing, um, the floors, window sills, um, the venting ductwork and fans had all been removed, the office lighting, um, the smoke detection system. So it was essentially a, a bare shell um, of the premises. Um, at the time of the hearing before the first instance judge, there was no dispute that all of these items that had been removed by the tenant uh, had been part of the original uh, base build specification. And so were either landlord's fixtures um, or even part of the premises themselves. And um, uh, the first instance judge, when considering the state of the premises, uh, made the following findings, uh, that they were empty, and devoid of essential fixtures and fittings, that the premises were dysfunctional and unoccupiable, and that the tenant had deliberately stopped works to reinstate the premises in the hopes of negotiating a settlement with the landlord. But what had happened was that no settlement had been forthcoming and the clock had run down in the meantime. Um, the landlord argued and was successful at first instance in arguing um, that the definition of premises given that it expressly included all landlords' fixtures and fittings, uh, meant that the delivering up of the unit without those essential fixtures and fittings uh, was such that the tenant had failed to deliver up vacant possession of the premises. And the first instance judge agreed uh, with the landlord and held that the notice uh, was an invalid notice. Uh, the Court of Appeal rejected uh, this argument. Um, it held that there was an obligation on the tenant to yield up the premises uh, with all the fixtures and fittings in place and that the tenant was in breach of its lease and the landlord had a remedy in damages uh, for those uh, breaches, but that the break clause did not specify that the tenant had to comply with its repairing obligations in order to exercise uh, the break. The Court of Appeals said that if that was the intention behind the break clause, then those words should have been expressly included in the break clause. And what in fact uh, the tenant was obliged to do was to give vacant possession, and that that is not concerned with the physical state of the premises. It's concerned with three things, and those are people, chattels, and legal interest. Uh, so what a tenant must make sure that they do is ensure that they leave no people behind on the premises, that they've created no interests in the premises which prevent uh, the landlord from recovering possession of the premises, and it's left no chattels in the premises. And the Court of Appeal approved Cumberland Consolidated Holding, which uh, considers when leaving chattels would be an interference uh, or a breach of the obligation to deliver up vacant possession. And in that case, what you have to show 
is that uh, the chattels are such a physical impediment that they substantially prevent or interfere with the enjoyment of the right to possession of a substantial part of the property. Uh, so the Court of Appeal decided that uh, that hadn't happened and so uh, the tenant had given vacant possession and uh, the break notice had been validly exercised and the lease brought to an end. Um, so the Court of Appeal decision is good news for uh, lessees. Um, the first instant decision had caused concern that break clauses might be even more onerously construed um, against uh, tenants. And that is no longer a concern following the Court of Appeal decision. In fact, at the end of its decision, the Court of Appeal expressly stated that the fact that the conditions attaching to a, to a break have to be strictly complied with does not mean that the clause has to be strictly construed in favour of the lessor and uh, adversely uh, to the tenant. Uh, actually, there's uh, more good news uh, this year as well, uh, because uh, in another High Court decision about a break clause, um, the court decided that it was prepared to imply a term into a landlord's break. Um, the break in that case was expressed to be exercisable at any time. Uh, but the court, having reviewed all of the evidence, considered that actually the break uh, could only be exercised uh, when an an, an event of default on the part of the tenant um, persisted. Uh, so that's an interesting and useful case to consider if you're uh, acting for lessees. Um, so having uh, run quickly through that decision, um, one of the things that we need to consider if we're acting particularly for tenants um, is what do we need to make sure that they do in order to comply with any preconditions to the exercise of a break clause? And uh, the answer to that was given to us by Lord Justice Mellish uh, back in the 19th century, when he said, um, about a case in which the tenant had to comply with repairing obligations. In a case like this, if a tenant wishes to claim the benefit of such covenant, he should send in his surveyor to see what repairs are needed and should affect the repairs which the surveyor certifies to be requisite. The court would be inclined to give credit to a survey thus honestly made and would lean towards holding the condition precedent to have been complied with. So very sensible advice which I think we can basically boil down um, to the following seven points. Um, you need expert advice early to identify exactly what is required to validly exercise a break clause. Um, where necessary, it's important to get your surveying done well in advance of any deadlines. Um, you need to consider erring on the side of caution if you think there might be any dispute about uh, the standard of repair that applies in relation to the lease. Now, landlords may not be cooperative, uh, but it's always sensible and evidentially very, very useful to try and involve them in explaining to you at an early stage what their concerns are. So you should try to agree a schedule of works uh, with the landlord at an early stage. It's always sensible to consider negotiating to see if a payment can be made in order to waive compliance with any uh, repairing obligations or other tenant covenants. If you are going to have to um, carry out building works uh, to effect repairs to the premises, it's going to be important to instruct trustworthy contractors and also to have all of the works properly supervised. And then when the works have been carried out, um, ask the landlord surveyor to inspect the works uh, to say whether or not uh, he or she is satisfied with uh, those works and to stipulate if there's anything that they aren't uh, satisfied with. Um, interestingly, uh, there is actually the case of Goldman Sachs International, um, which if you look at the facts, is very similar to Capital Park and I think was actually stronger for the landlord on uh, requiring the tenant to uh, effect repair works in order to be able to exercise the tenant's break. Um, but there was a disagreement between the landlord and the tenant in that case. And what the tenant sensibly decided to do was make an application in good time to the court for a declaration uh, 
as to what it was required to do in order to exercise the brake. Um, so it's worth considering doing that. In that case, um, Mr. Justice Nugi decided um, that it was not a requirement of the brake clause that the tenant had to comply with its repairing obligations. And uh, he was quite clear that if a landlord wants to impose preconditions in a brake clause, then the drafting of the clause in the lease has to be very clear and expressly state um, what is required. Um, there was a cross reference to another clause in the lease in the clause in that case. And Mr. Justice Nugi said that cross referring like that created ambiguity and was insufficiently clear uh, for the landlord to be able to rely upon it as a precondition. Um, it's quite interesting that Mr. Justice Nugi in that case considered the application of the contra preferentum rule in the construction of leases. Um, he accepted that it was a principle that still survives, uh, but he called it a make weight argument. And um, in the particular example of a tenant's break, which contains preconditions, he said it's the landlord who is the profferens, who benefits from the precondition. And so uh, the clause is construed against the interests of the landlord. And I just mentioned that really, because uh, right at the start of the talk, I was talking about where you have a break clause that doesn't specify whether it's the landlord or the tenant that can exercise it. That case was decided specifically on the application of the con contra preferentum rule. And it does beg the question whether the case would be decided in the same way today. Uh, but anyway, I think it's settled law, so I think um, we can rely upon uh, that case, even though I think it would be decided differently today. Uh, and just before I finish up, I'm just going to draw your attention to the RICS leasing code for business premises. This is the code that is, uh, applies to surveyors uh, when they're negotiating uh, leases between parties. And I just wanted to draw your attention particularly to clause 2.4, uh, because you can see there that it's the RICS view that break clauses should not be drawn up so as to be conditional on a, a tenant complying with repairing clauses. It says there they should be conditional only on the tenant paying all basic rent payable on any date before the break date, giving up occupation and leaving no subtenants or other occupiers. Disputes about the state of the premises or what has been left behind or removed should be settled later as at normal lease expiry. And so if you are acting for a tenant who is in the process of negotiating a lease, you may find that that is a very useful resource to use um, when you're doing the negotiations. I'll hand over to Matthew. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Mills, and I'm here to talk to you about interfering with easements. Now, I picked this topic for two main reasons. Firstly, as we all know, people love litigating about their property rights, and it's always good to know the basics. But secondly, even though we've got cases stretching back to the early 1200s on this issue, the law is still developing. In particular, issues relating to parking and key fobs pushing the boundaries of the law as it currently stands. But historical trivia aside, what I plan to do today is talk to you about three practical topics. Firstly, I'll set out the general principles which the court will apply when deciding whether someone has interfered with an easement. Secondly, I'll then summarise some of the key cases relating to the main classes of easements, for example, rights of way, rights to light. And thirdly, I'll then discuss the various remedies which your client might be able to claim if their easement has been interfered with. All right, let's get straight to it and talk about general principles. The cause of action which claimants rely on in easements cases is private nuisance. The dominant owner, cannot rely on trespass because they don't possess the servient land. In fact, if the dominant owner's rights leave the servient owner without possession or control of their land, then arguably this wouldn't be an easement at all. Now, a useful point to bear in mind when thinking about the cause of action is that a successor in title to the servient owner can be liable for their predecessor's actions if they adopt them as their own. Now, a good example is the Saint and Jenner case. In that case, the original servient owner installed speed bumps on a private road. Over time, potholes developed around those speed bumps and interfered with the free flow of traffic. 
the successor in title to the servient owner did nothing about it and was found liable for substantially interfering with the easements that went over that road. Now the law in this area is predominantly derived from case law and much of it is quite dated. But when you strip away all the reams of writing in the mountains of cases, the basic question is actually pretty simple. Has the defendant substantially interfered with the claimant's enjoyment of their rights? Now, you may be thinking, why on earth did I tune into this webinar if the answer is substantial? Well, the problem is the test is pretty easy to state, but can be quite tricky to apply in particular cases. Fortunately, we get a bit more detail from the well-known B&Q case. In a judgment which has been cited at least twice by the Court of Appeal, Mr Justice Blackburn laid down four helpful propositions. Firstly, he said, the test is not whether the claimant is left with a reasonable use of the land. Instead, the question is whether it's reasonable for him to insist on the full extent of his rights. Secondly, unless the dominant owner's views are unreasonable or perverse, the servient owner can't say, well, Joe Bloggs wouldn't complain if I did this, why should you complain? For example, if a dominant owner has a right of way which allows them to drive or use a horse-drawn carriage, the dominant owner is entitled to insist on using a horse-drawn carriage, even if everyone else in their right mind would use a car. Thirdly, the servient owner can't just deprive the dominant owner of some rights and say, well, you've still got other rights left over, that's enough. For example, if the dominant owner can access a route at any point along a boundary, the servient owner can't just build a wall along the side and install one door, even if they let the dominant owner choose where that one door goes. Overall, in summary, the test is one of convenience and not necessity or even reasonable necessity. So it's very pro-dominant owner. Now in court, I'd always recommend citing the B&Q case, but if you'd like a short summary to give to a client that can be more easy to understand, then I suggest you use this quote from the old case of Hutton and Hambra. There, Chief Justice Coburn said, the question is whether practically and substantially the easement can be exercised as conveniently as before, or whether the dominant owner has really lost anything by the alteration made by the servient owner. If you think that for all practical and useful purposes, the easement is the same as before, find for the servient owner. If you think otherwise, find for the dominant owner. So these are the general principles, and as you can see, they're pretty high level and vague. So what I'll try and do now is give you a bit more guidance on the five most common types of easements. And of course, we start with rights of way. As Halsbury's explains, the question whether any particular interruption amounts to an unlawful interference depends upon the nature of the right of way, the place, and the general circumstances of the case. For example, it's more acceptable for a servient owner to lock the outer door to a block of flats on a busy street than it is for the servient owner to lock a remote field gate in the middle of the countryside. To put it bluntly, context is king. But let me talk about some specific issues that might be helpful for you and your clients. Even an occasional obstruction to the right of way can be a substantial interference. For example, in the Dugdale case, the court held that running a small number of trains along a disused train track, which was where the route of the easement went, amounted to a substantial interference. Similarly, narrowing the width of the route of the easement can amount to a substantial interference. On the other hand, though, don't forget that servient owners are perfectly entitled to build right up to the very boundary of the route. There is no entitlement to swing space, as it's sometimes called. Similarly, it may be a substantial interference to construct a tunnel over the route if that restricts the height of vehicles which can pass along it. So in short, the general principle is that the servient owner cannot alter or interfere with the route of the right of way unless there's an express power in the grant for them to do so. That said, the interference does not need to be on the land itself. For example, in the Waterman and Boyle case, Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, suggested that making loud noises next to a cattle track could amount to a substantial interference if those noises prevented the cattle from passing along the track. And finally, the court can take into account the servient owner's motive in interfering with the easement. 
In other words, the court's more likely to find that an interference is substantial if the servient owner is acted with malice. Now, one of the most common issues in rights of way is the installation of gates and locks. The starting point is that a gate or a lock is by definition an interference, but it's not necessarily a substantial interference. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, the dominant owner's route does not need to be free from any and all obstructions. It's this question of substantial. And secondly, the courts recognize that Serbian owners sometimes need to have security for their property or their home. Now, in these situations, it's quite common for the Serbian owner to offer the dominant owner a key to a new lock. And in some cases, that will prevent there being a substantial interference, but that's not always the case. For example, in Page, the Court of Appeal held that there was a substantial interference where the servient owner installed an electric locked gate, which could only be opened with a fob or a code. The court said that fobs can be lost, codes can be forgotten, and visitors and delivery drivers might not have access to either. Fortunately though, when trying to balance these competing interests, the courts are generally quite pragmatic in what they do. For example, in the Petty case, the court said that the gate needed to stay open during the dominant owner's business hours, but could be closed overnight. In the Kingsgate case, the court said that a touch button gate was preferable to a fob accessed gate for the reasons I've just explained. And in general, the more gates, the more locks there are along the route, the more likely the interference is to be substantial. For example, in the Siggery case, there were four gates within the space of 50 meters. That was held to be a substantial interference. Let's move on now to parking easements. A common cause of friction between neighbours is where people park, but there are three useful cases here on the issue of interference. In Stonebridge, Mr Justice Newberger, as he then was, held that it is a substantial interference with a parking easement if the dominant owner is unable to park on their designated spot, even if they've got space elsewhere. Similarly, in Kettle, Judge Cook held that the servient owner could not avoid liability simply by offering to move the spot to a different place to allow the servient owner to build on the original spot. And in the Leon case, the Canadian court held that attempting to give the dominant owner's customers directions on where to park was a substantial interference with the dominant owner's rights to have customers park on the land. So those are some useful cases which can hopefully help you in any parking disputes you have. Let's move on to rights to light. The general rule is that an interference will be substantial if, as a matter of common sense, there's been such a deprivation of light as to render the occupation of the dominant land uncomfortable in accordance with the ordinary ideas of mankind. Now that's quite a vague phrase, but fortunately, in applying it, the court will consider not just what the property is used for, but whether the light is enough for all the ordinary purposes for which the dominant land might expect to be used. A very important case in the modern era is Midtown. This held that the fact that dominant owners use artificial light extensively does not prevent them from complaining about a lack of natural light. So this is particularly important in modern office blocks, which are very close together. Thirdly, there's no particular rule about how much light any individual room needs to receive. There's no 45 degrees rule, there's no minimum number of lumens. In practice, then, what you need to do is you need to get an expert report from someone who's an expert in light to measure the lumens of light around the room at different times and in different places, and then take a view on whether that's a substantial interference. Let's briefly turn to water courses. Now, there are relatively few modern reported examples on interferences with water causes. So I'll give you five old examples of what might constitute a substantial interference. Firstly, polluting the water that the dominant owner takes. Secondly, diverting the river over which the dominant owner's easement runs. Thirdly, siphoning off water that the dominant owner takes through a pipe. Fourthly, connecting your own drain to the dominant owner's pipe to drain fluid into it. 
And fifthly, preventing the dominant owner from drawing water from a spring. Now, as I said, these are quite old and quite niche cases, but hopefully they'll give you a starting point if you have a water course case on your books. Finally, I'll mention a couple of points about the right to support. Now, the general rule is that a servient owner will substantially interfere with the right to support if they remove the support and this causes a change in the state of the dominant property. In other words, there's no claim until the dominant property suffers some kind of physical damage. It's not enough that there's simply a diminution in value. On the other hand, there will be no interference if the servient owner simply replaces one mode of support with another. For example, if they take away the soil and replace it with concrete foundations. So that's a summary of what counts as an interference. The second half of this webinar will focus on what remedies your client might be able to claim if their easement has been interfered with. And let's start with a few general principles about remedies. Firstly, a dominant owner can bring a nuisance claim whether their easement was expressly granted, impliedly created, or created by prescription. Also, a dominant owner can claim any combination of the remedies that I'm about to talk about. So don't feel you have to pigeonhole your claim into one particular slot. The general rule is that anyone who's entitled to possession of the dominant land can bring the claim. Now, as a consequence, if someone only has a remainder or a reversionary interest in the land, they generally can't bring a claim unless the interference is permanent. Because obviously, a permanent interference affects not just the people who are entitled now, but the people who will be entitled in future. When it comes to issuing a claim, it's generally sensible to join the occupiers of both the dominant and the servient plots of land, just to ensure that everybody's bound by the outcome. Also, practically, if the dispute is significant enough that it could substantially affect the value of your property, then I'd suggest that you notify your lender at an early stage, just so there are no nasty surprises later on. Now, we started this talk with B&Q, and we're now moving on to DIY. Thank you very much. Abatement is the ancient common law right to enter onto another's land and take reasonable steps to end an interference. Now, clients are often really keen to know about their common law rights to do it themselves because, to put it simply, it's much quicker and cheaper than paying lawyers to go through the courts. But you should be extremely cautious about what you advise your clients to do here for both practical and legal reasons. Practically, it's very easy for disputes about land to descend into heated or even aggressive arguments. And legally, as I'm about to show you, the four principles are all very restrictive on when the right to abate can be exercised. Firstly, the general rule is that the dominant owner can only abate a nuisance in clear and simple cases or in an emergency. Now, a clear and simple case would be one where litigation is disproportionate because the interference is so easy to remove and so obviously wrong. For example, a branch has fallen off a tree. Secondly, if the interference is on the dominant owner's own land, for example, it's an overhanging branch, they don't need to notify the servient owner before they can remove it. But in any other case, if you're going to go onto the servient owner's land, you need to give them reasonable notice. You can't just rock up unless there's a real emergency. Thirdly, in all cases, the dominant owner must do no more than what's practically necessary to abate the nuisance. In other words, they must do what's the least invasive thing possible to remedy the situation. And finally, importantly, if this does go to court, the burden's on the dominant owner to prove that they acted lawfully. The servient owner hasn't got to prove anything. So for all these reasons, you should be very careful about advising your client to abate any kind of reasonably serious nuisance. What about the other side of the coin? Can the servient owner alter the route of an easement? Well, the answer is yes, if the original grant gave them the power to do so. In practice, though, very few easements have that power. And if there isn't an express clause allowing them to alter the route, then they can't unilaterally do so. Importantly, there's a case called Selby and Nettleford, which can really help dominant owners. What that case says is, if a servient owner blocks a right of way, the dominant owner is allowed to deviate around the blockage using other parts of the servient owner's land. 
Now, this doesn't create a new easement. This doesn't formally vary the route of the original easement. This is simply a temporary equitable remedy while the interference is still in place. And this can be a very powerful negotiating tool for Serbian predominant owners because they can say to the Serbian owner, I have this right just to go around it, so you're not going to stop me. In many cases, though, what your client will really want is a final and binding decision on the existence or the extent of their easement. And that's where declarations come into it. A declaration is simply an order of the court recording a decision on an issue of law or fact. Now, declarations can be useful for both dominant owners and servient owners. For example, on the one hand, a dominant owner can seek a declaration to prove that they have an easement or that something would amount to an interference. On the other hand, a servient owner can seek a declaration that a proposed action, say a building project they've got coming up, would not amount to a substantial interference. And one of the key benefits of the declaration is that it will be binding on the successors in title to both parties. So to put it bluntly, a declaration settles the position long-term. However, unlike other remedies, it is not contempt of court to go against the terms of a declaration. If, for example, the Serbian owner continues to ignore the declaration, what the dominant owner needs to do is apply for an injunction to enforce the terms of the declaration and then enforce that injunction if it's ignored. That can be quite an involved process. So if you are applying for a declaration, I'd suggest that in the draft order you add a clause giving the parties liberty to apply for an injunction to enforce any declaration. That can help speed up the process a little. Now, even though declarations are an important and long-standing remedy, there's surprisingly little judicial guidance on when the court will make one. However, fortunately, Mr. Justice Miles gave a very useful summary of the few principles we have in the recent Malvern Muse case. In summary, the power to award a declaration is discretionary. And what the court thinks is that there must be a real and present dispute between the parties as to the existence or the extent of an easement. But the claimant does not need to have a formal cause of action yet. In other words, there doesn't need to have been a substantial interference yet before you can claim a declaration. In practice, the court says, each party must be affected by the result in some way. Now, when deciding what to do, obviously, the overarching aim of the courts is to do justice between the parties. And importantly, the court will expect all sides of the argument to be put to it so it can have an informed view, because like I said, this settles the position long term. And finally, the court will not make a declaration if there's something else that could more effectively resolve the dispute, for example, damages or an injunction. Fortunately, though, it's perfectly possible to claim a declaration whether or not you're claiming any other remedy. That's what Rule 20, 4020 of the CPR tells us. So this is how it's possible to effectively get a preemptive declaration. My final point on declarations is practical. When it comes to drafting a declaration, make sure it is as clear and unambiguous as possible. If you feel you need it, you can annex a detailed plan or some photographs to the order, because the last thing you want is for the situation in Dicker to occur. In that case, the parties had entire litigation over the terms of a declaration. They then disputed what the declaration given meant, and that separate piece of litigation went all the way to the Court of Appeal. You can imagine how pleased the clients were at having to spend two lots of legal fees. So to avoid that horrible situation happening, make sure your declaration is as clear and unambiguous as possible. After abatement, an injunction is probably the most effective remedy in an easement dispute. And the main benefit and the main disadvantage to an easement are effectively the opposite of the benefits and disadvantages of declarations. On the one hand, injunctions are only binding on the parties to the claim. But on the other hand, breach of an injunction is contempt of court. So there's a much more powerful way of enforcing them. Like injunctions, like declarations, sorry, injunctions are a discretionary remedy. And a good summary of the relevant principles can be found in Snell's Equity, Chapter 18, which is on Westlaw Books if you have it. But in particular, the court will ask itself, is there a risk that the defendant will interfere with the easement again in future if no injunction is granted? They'll also ask, 
would damages be an adequate remedy for the claimant? Although in easement cases, the courts are generally pretty relaxed on this. Thirdly, the court will ask whether the claimant is guilty of unduly delaying in bringing a claim. And if they have delayed, whether this has prejudiced the defendant. For example, did the claimant let the defendant finish their building project before complaining about it? And finally, the court will consider whether either of the parties has acted particularly poorly during the litigation. For example, whether the defendant tried to steal a march on the claimant by building in secret, or whether the claimant has simply wildly overreacted to what is a relatively trivial interference. Now, one of the key questions for a dominant owner in an easement dispute is whether to apply for an interim injunction. Now, the answer to that really depends on the facts of your case. But in deciding this issue, I'd suggest that you consider the following practical points. Firstly, will something irrevocable happen if the claimant doesn't get an interim injunction? For example, will construction work begin or complete? Secondly, on the one hand, how inconvenient would it be for the claimant to wait until trial to get their injunction? Thirdly, on the other hand, how inconvenient would it be for the defendant to have to comply with an injunction that may be set aside at trial? Fourthly, how much additional work and cost would it involve to issue the application and attend the hearings? But fifthly, how likely is it that the defendant would capitulate entirely if you get an interim injunction? And finally, and quite importantly, can your client afford to give a cross undertaking in damages? My last point about injunctions is the same as the one I made about declarations. It's important to be as precise as possible about what you want the defendant to do or not do, because if there's any uncertainty, you have to go back to court. The last remedy which the court can award is damages. Now, typically damages are the least important remedy in an easement dispute, because the parties are in general more concerned with establishing their rights for the future than about claiming a few thousand pounds of compensation. Nevertheless, many clients will want to claim everything they possibly can from the defendant, particularly for the stress and inconvenience of the dispute. If your client does want to consider damages, then there are two things for you to consider. Firstly, damages for the cause of, cause of action private nuisance. And secondly, damages in lieu of an injunction. Now damages for nuisance in the easement context are calculated on the standard tort basis. In other words, the claimants awarded damages equivalent to the loss that they have actually suffered. Now in practice, the dominant owner may be able to claim different types of damages. For example, the dominant owner will usually claim damages for loss of amenity, although typically these kinds of damages are relatively modest, only up to a few thousand pounds. However, the dominant owner may also be able to claim more substantial compensation for consequential financial loss, for example, for lost profits if the easement benefited a commercial premises, or potentially diminution in value of the property if the interference is or is likely to be permanent. Finally, in exceptional circumstances, the dominant owner may also be able to claim aggravated damages if the servient owner has acted particularly poorly. For example, in the Owers case, the defendant deliberately blocked the easement and then tried to intimidate the claimant when she raised the issue and tried to complain. So there are various things for you to consider with your client before deciding the amount of any claim. The final topic is damages in lieu of an injunction. Now, historically, when deciding whether to award damages in lieu of an injunction, the court supplied the four principles set out in the good working rule in the Shelfer case. However, in Coventry and Lawrence, the Supreme Court suggested that the working rule was outdated. And instead, in all cases, the court should simply weigh up all of the competing factors and exercise an unfettered discretion. Nevertheless, since Coventry and Lawrence, the Shelfer factors have still been considered by the court and they are at least useful principles to have in mind. So don't ignore them entirely. And finally, if the court decides that it will award damages in lieu of an injunction, then when deciding how much to award, the court should consider the 12 principles set out by Lord Reed in the one step decision. Now I don't have the time or the space to refer to all 12, but I've given you the reference on the slide, which you'll receive after this webinar is over. <clears throat> 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning. Please do join us again next month for the next Radcliffe Chambers Talks real estate event. But until then, stay safe. We hope to see you soon. And it's thank you very much from me. And thank you very much from Marie Claire.